Um, good evening, everyone, and thank you for being here this evening for tonight's program. My name is Constance, and uh, I'm here with my colleague, Stefna, and we welcome you tonight for our, to our presentation. Um, I just want to let you know that tonight, after the presentation, we will be taking questions and answers. So if you want to, if you have any questions, you can go down to the bottom of your screen where it says Q&A. And if you click on that box, it will open up and then you can um, type in your question. And then at the end, we'll go through all the questions and, and, and uh, Ron can answer them at that point. Okay, and so now I'm gonna turn this over to Stefana to start our presentation. All right. And this, at the end of the evening, uh, Ron will be joined by his wife, Pam, and they will both be answering uh, questions that you pose for them. Um, in June of 2019, uh, Ron and Pam Rogers, they traveled to China with friends. And it was a small group, so they were able to customize their tour, starting out in Beijing and ending three weeks later in Shanghai. They visited sites such as the Forbidden City and the Great Wall. Their journey included a cruise on the Yangtze River. Ron's photographic eye captured many fascinating and interesting subjects as he traveled this vast and diverse country. He has many fun stories and he has some wonderful images of his remarkable journey. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce tonight, Ron Rogers. Go ahead, Ron. Okay. Well, hello and welcome. Um, a few uh, things I'd like to get out of the way here. First off, uh, I'd like to um, thank the Napa County Library for uh, hosting this wonderful series. And uh, also special thanks to both Constance and uh, Stephanie for um, uh, hosting as well. Uh, I do have a disclaimer, and that disclaimer is I don't speak Chinese, so please uh, uh, regard my mispronunciations with uh, a bit of forgiving. <laughs> uh, I've been a photographer and a teacher for many years. Uh, we've, it's something that is uh, really important to me. I enjoy traveling around the world, um, my wife and I do, and many of our friends, we do the same thing as well. Um, our group, as uh, Stefan mentioned, it was a small group. There were only four of us, and uh, uh, we tried to keep it just within China. Um, originally, we were talking about going to Tibet, but we decided not to do that. We decided to stick with China. And uh, for me personally, um, as a photographer, um, photography is kind of a visual delight. And I prepared a little thing here. I'll just read this. I said, for me, traveling is a visual delight. The journey is more important than where I go. The world is ripe with chance encounters, visual and otherwise. Travel gives us the opportunity to see common bonds and a larger picture of life on this planet. So with that, I'm going to move us on here and um, we'll start with this. This is the uh, flag of China. Most of you have seen this certainly during the Olympic Games, uh, but it, like most flags, it has a certain amount of uh, symbology as well. The large star uh, denotes the uh, Communist Party. Uh, remember, this is a communist country. <laughs> and uh, the four smaller stars designate the uh, four social classes, which are uh, the working class, the peasantry, the urban petite bourgeoisie, and the national bourgeoisie. Um, you'll have to do some reading to figure out what those distinctions really are. Um, China is a huge area, um, but interestingly, in terms of square miles, it covers about the same territory as the United States. Uh, and let me qualify, they include Tibet as an autonomous territory. They also include Taiwan. Uh, which would probably disagree, but as an autonomous territory. So those things all combined end up uh, being a lot of uh, territory. And uh, about 3.7 million uh, square miles for China. And we're about the same when you include Alaska, Hawaii, and some of our territories. The population is enormous. It's the largest population of any nation on the planet. They have essentially a billion more people than we do. And that's a lot. Uh, closely behind them, of course, is uh, uh, India. Uh, there are 55 officially recognized, that means the government recognizes 55 different ethnic groups. Uh, all those scholars have mentioned that there are probably closer to 200. The major religions uh, are um, 
Buddhism, Catholicism, Taoism, Islam, Protest Protestantism. Um, what, what's interesting is that there are also banned religions, among them the Falun Gong, which you may have heard of. Uh, they've demonstrated there quite a bit. Um, the Tibetan Buddhists are also banned, as well as the, uh, more recently we've seen the Uyghur Muslims um, in Western China banned. The um, Yangtze River is the longest river in Asia. It's also the longest river within a single country, and it's the third longest uh, river in the world. China, interestingly, only uses one time zone. It's called Beijing Standard Time. However, just because of the distance of the country, it actually spans what would be five different time zones. A um, Couple other things here. Let me go back for a moment here. Let me give you a couple things here. Um, just some other interesting factoids that you might uh, enjoy about, uh, about China. 50% of the world's pigs reside in China, and I believe it. China's railroads, if you hook them all up end to end, would uh, circle the, uh, the earth twice. Um, it's estimated that 20 million trees are cut every year to meet China's needs for chopsticks. Uh, China has now the world's largest standing army and a navy. Uh, one in five people in the world are Chinese. And uh, China is now the world's largest economy and exporter, also the planet's greatest polluter. Um, the main primary language in China is uh, standard Chinese, which is based on Mandarin. Uh, let's see. It, you'll see some interesting pictures I, 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 as we go along here. And the fact that uh, in 2020, China had tried to move 60% of its population to the urban centers. Uh, they basically wanted to shift the country from rural agrarian to urban production. And uh, that also kind of comes to, well, we'll take a look at some slides that I think that'll help uh, qualify that for you. Let's start out, uh, th this is our trip. We started out in, uh, up here in Beijing. We went by train to Xi'an. Uh, we flew down to Guilin, a beautiful area which in Southern Cal um, <laughs> China, uh, close to Vietnam. Uh, from there, we flew up to Chengdu. Uh, the city of the pandas. And then we took a train again to uh, uh, Shangqing. And then from there, we uh, got on the um, uh, Yangtze River and uh, traveled on down. And uh, we, had, we stopped at uh, Yichang and then uh, took a train again to Zhangjiajie. And then finally, we ended up in Shanghai, which is the terminus of the Yangtze River. Uh, as it comes into the Pacific Ocean there. My tools, pretty simple actually. Um, I like, I have professional cameras. Uh, I use them at home, but when I travel, I like to keep it light and simple. And so I use an iPhone. Uh, the new iPhones are wonderful, by the way, especially the pro versions, uh, but the cameras are uh, very, very good in these phones. And then uh, I use a Canon um, uh, mega zoom, um, basically a pocket uh, camera. And uh, it works quite well. And not as good as the professional cameras, but I think you'll enjoy these pictures quite well. We'll start out here in Beijing. And uh, this happens to be inside the Forbidden City. But uh, let's step back a bit. Food. <laughs> when you arrive in a new country, it's kind of one of the first things you want to do. And of course, all four of us absolutely love Chinese food. So we wandered through food courts and looked for some, uh, looked for a target. And uh, I noticed this menu and I thought, well, it must be actually a pretty good food because over here on the right is the chef <laughs> eating his own food. So that was a good sign. And a dumpling uh, restaurant here. One thing I think of interest is uh, there's a lot of sculpture you'll see on the streets of, um, of Beijing. Um, Streets, by the way, there are incredibly clean. They have armies of people that sweep up all the time, but people usually just don't throw things on the uh, ground. And uh, um, it's, a, it's a very clean environment. And um, there's a lot of new stores and uh, corporations that you'll find there. They, they influence from all over the world. Something that I found very old world and wonderful were these sculptures, uh, bronze sculptures on the sidewalks. And there were several of them. Uh, one was of a... Uh, a young man combing his, um, his grandfather's uh, hair. 
And uh, this one is, of course, the musician and uh, the, the woman um, uh, dancer. And what's interesting uh, is if you notice these kind of polished areas uh, on the legs, on the thighs, and on the arm, uh, that's very uh, common in uh, China. People will walk by and they will touch them there. And so you'll see people constantly touching them for good luck. Tiananmen Square. This is the largest cultural and political plaza in the world. It's, it's really enormous. It's about, uh, its length is about nine football fields by about, and it's width about five football fields. It's huge. Uh, it's flanked by the Chinese National Museum on one side, the People's Congress, which you're looking at here. Uh, off to our left would be uh, a memorial um, area for uh, Mao Zedong, who was the original communist leader of China. And, um, and then, of course, on the other side, you have the Forbidden City. If you notice in this photograph to the right, this is the entrance area uh, of the Forbidden City. The other thing is you're really carefully watched in China. There are cameras everywhere, and this is no exception. Uh, we were there um, one week after the 30th anniversary of the uh, democracy movement, student democracy movement, uh, which kind of went sour when the uh, government decided to send in the military and they began firing on the students. Um, it's kind of a tough event. Uh, it's been pretty much erased from the history there. They don't, uh, students don't know about it unless they go on the internet and uh, try to find things out that way or by word of mouth. Inside the Forbidden City, well, you could spend days here, I think, really looking around. Uh, just wonderful photographs everywhere and uh, fascinating architecture. Again, it's just immaculate. It's, uh, th this was a city that was burned and ransacked many times, but uh, it's pretty much as it has been since the 1700s, as you see it today. Enormous gates and doors. How would you like to have screen doors made for these guys? <laughs> I'll just let you look at some of these. Uh, intricate and wonderful architecture everywhere. A lot of hand painting. Beautiful roof lines. This is a kind of an interesting adornment on the corner uh, of the roofs of buildings. Um, apparently, the more important you are, the more little critters you can have there uh, on the uh, roof line. Uh, I think as I, we were told that uh, the, the emperor, only the emperor could have as many as nine. Everybody else was somewhat less. And again, just a tile detail, the intricacy and uh, beauty of the place. This lovely door here on the left, those rich, vibrant colors, this door knocker. We were standing back in the shade to get out of the heat and uh, I was just admiring this couple. They were having a great time communicating, talking, and sharing a lunch and uh, enjoying their city. We bumped into this artist, and uh, he would uh, paint your, uh, or your, make a depiction of your, your uh, portrait, uh, your visage on the, on the sidewalks using a, a, a tube there that had water in it and uh, a sponge on the end. So he was painting with water on the concrete. That was fun. Akin to the um, Forbidden City uh, is also the Summer Palace. And uh, th this is where during the summers to get out of the heat of uh, the other city, um, the emperors and all of the uh, those that followed <laughs> the royal court would come to the Summer Palace to relax and enjoy a slightly cooler environment. Uh, this is a, an enormous lake uh, that is man-made. It was dug out uh, by hand and um, um, so it's an artificial lake. The hills surrounding it are actually made from all the earth that was removed. Uh, people like to go out on the lake. You can rent a boat. If you have a big party and you wanna have a party out on the lake, you can rent a barge and uh, enjoy a nice day out there. There are beautiful walking paths around the uh, Summer Palace and particularly the lake. Here's a, um, a walkway that virtually goes around the entire lake. There's also a covered walkway if you want to get out of the sun that's quite beautiful and uh, goes for miles. I love this uh, pine tree <laughs> on the right. It uh, it's kind of has a natural camouflage pattern to it. 
I thought, boy, you could really bump into these things in the middle of the forest. It's uh, anyway, quite unusual. The Great Wall of China is north of uh, Beijing. And um, it really is a sight to behold. Um, a lot of times we think of it as a single wall. It's large enough that it can be seen from outer space. Um, but actually it's many different walls. Uh, one emperor finally kind of connected the most important parts of it together to create what we call the Great Wall today. Um, this area, this one on the left, you can see it's been beautifully restored. On the right, um, this is what most of the wall looks like uh, where it's been unreconstructed and as it's been for centuries. Uh, this diagram kind of shows the walls of, uh, of China and they go as far north as uh, Russia and further south. And you can see all the different kinds. Uh, there's a chart here, a colored chart that explains uh, the years that they were built. I like this shot, it's kind of one of my last shots there. And I always enjoy taking photographs of people when we're on the road. And uh, I, I enjoyed this couple at a restaurant we stopped at, and that painting on the wall behind them, very nice. These are tea bags, not the kind you're used to putting in your cup. These wouldn't fit in your cup. <laughs> They're about five feet tall and about a foot across. And uh, this is what loose leaf tea is uh, shipped in. When we left Beijing, we traveled south to the city of uh, Xi'an. And um, we went on uh, a bullet train or high-speed train. These trains travel, they're very smooth, they're quiet. They travel at about uh, 130 to 170 miles per hour. So you can cover a lot of territory very quickly. Um, very nice to do if, you, if you're there. And they have a lot of these trains throughout much of uh, China. I wish we had one. Looking out the windows, you don't have, it's hard to shoot because you're shooting through the glass and there's reflections, but um, I shot these just to kind of give an idea about some of the incredible amount of building that is going on in China today. Um, the, uh, it, it's estimated that 60% um, of the world's cement is consumed by China. In two years, China uses more cement than the United States did in the entire 20th century. That's an incredible fact, an incredible number. Uh, they, they claim that they are putting up a high rise. These are all high rise residential towers, by the way. And uh, to accommodate these people, they wanna move in from the um, uh, rural areas. Uh, it almost looks like the new wall of Great Wall of China, doesn't it? It's, uh, there's some of them are packed in so close. Um, they are uh, built to withstand a 7.0 earthquake. And that's one of the reasons I think that the government uses, or at least uh, one of the rationales to try to move people into the urban centers other than having cheap uh, labor. But, uh, and that is safety because uh, just as an example, in 2008, in the Sichuan uh, province, there was a quake that killed 87,000 plus people. Um, and that just took a couple minutes to do. Uh, in 1976, there was the uh, Tangshan, uh, Tangshan uh, earthquake that killed um, over 242,000 people. So there's certain logic here of getting people into safer residences that uh, don't collapse easily when the ground begins to shake. Xi'an is probably best known, well, it's known for a lot of wonderful things, but probably the most, the predominant point that everybody wants to go to Xi'an for is to see the terracotta warriors. Um, this is a, a, just an amazing um, assemblage. Uh, these were funerary um, uh, sculptures that were done, uh, meaning that when the emperor was buried, this was his kind of symbolic army to accompany him to the afterworld. And uh, just to give you an idea, there were um, some 8,000 of these terracotta so soldiers made, uh, 520 horses, 130 chariots, and over 40,000 bronze weapons uh, were found. This site was actually, it's a fairly recent site. This site was found uh, only in 1974. So it's not even 50 years since we discovered this. Uh, it's in these three huge pits covered by uh, just uh, airport hangar type um, an environment. Uh, I mean, you could fit probably four 747s in here easily. But it's quite a sight to behold. These have been um, 
re put together, they've been refashioned and uh, put out for display. They'll never get around to exhuming everything here. It's been, uh, it's just too big. And they felt that probably it's better to just leave much of it undisturbed. Um, it was found buried uh, under 15 feet of soil. So in other words, originally these were hallways and passages and um, uh, think of like a, uh, a storage locker thing on the edge of town. That's kind of the way this was built around the palace. And then the entire palace was buried and this was buried under 15 feet of earth. Uh, eventually, of course, after millennia, the uh, soil settled and crushed in the roof lines. Um, but, uh, and this is what they would find when they would dig out all the dirt, uh, mostly broken bits and pieces that were pieced back together. Going into the city of Xi'an, uh, it's a, uh, a lot of ethnic groups in Xi'an. Uh, it was on the Silk uh, Road, so uh, there's just many groups that represent uh, the city and uh, different, different ethnicities. Uh, this one restaurant that we uh, walked by, a tea house, uh, the, the uh, thing there to do was when you were through with your tea to walk outside and throw it onto the, uh, the mountain of shards there. But it was kind of fun to see. Uh, and food, oh my gosh, the variety. Um, crepes being made, Chinese crepes on the left. Uh, the fellow on the right is uh, grilling squid on a stick. Uh, these ladies are making what are probably best described as very much akin to Mexican churros. Uh, the dough is rolled and roped out and then deep fried, as you can see on the right. This fellow was making and selling, um, I, as I recall, wedding uh, bean cakes. And uh, quite interesting. One of the things I think that's really interesting, though, is uh, every country, every culture likes its uh, spicy foods, or they have a, a place for it. And China has a huge place for spicy foods, and especially with chilies. And uh, they make all different kinds of spicy condiments uh, from chilies and uh, as well as dry chili, like you can see on the right there. The fellow on the right here makes the, um, these dumplings. And uh, boy, talk about creative. Uh, these are really interesting and uh, something to be very proud of. The thing on the left is uh, the invisible man. Well, not really. It's just a sculpture, a plastic sculpture. But uh, tourists can come up and stand behind it and grab the chopsticks, but uh, I liked it just floating this way. Hotels are cheap in China. Uh, this is one of the hotels we stayed at, very modern, very nice. We were staying mostly in four and five star hotels. Um, in China, they're probably about the same price as lower priced hotels in the United States. So you can do quite well on your money and stay in very, very nice, uh, luxurious uh, environments. Uh, the building has been so rapid in China. Uh, the technology is just piled up on top of itself. And uh, you go outside these hotels and very often you look up and you see this kind of a situation on the right. Another beautiful thing about Xi'an is uh, the, this great wall. That's probably one of the most well-preserved uh, fortress walls around a city. And it surrounds the old city of, uh, of Xi'an. And uh, anyway, it, uh, the old city is absolutely beautiful. This will, uh, it's, it's big, it's really big. Uh, the wall is big. In fact, you can rent bicycles and ride around it. It's about nine miles uh, around the entire top of the wall. One of the interesting places inside the old city uh, is the uh, Muslim quarter. It's uh, not only home to uh, uh, this Muslim population, but uh, it's also home to the largest uh, mosque in all of China. And again, lots of interesting foods here. Uh, pig's hooves being cooked up here. These ladies are pounding uh, silver rod into uh, thinner pieces that can be made into jewelry. Beautiful head uh, dresses that they're wearing in their very colorful ethnic garb. I don't know if any of you know what this fruit is on the right. This is a considered a, a delicacy in much of Asia. This is durian. And uh, it's a uh, I think probably an acquired taste because it's very stinky. Uh, people describe the uh, smell as like dog feces, acquired taste. Some beautiful uh, flat leavened bread with sesame seeds, sunflower seeds. I mean, you could take this home and put it up on your wall. It's uh, quite beautiful. And this is a typical street inside the old city. 
Now on to uh, Guilin in the south above Vietnam. This is a beautiful country. Uh, it's uh, known as a uh, karst landscape, meaning it's mostly uh, limestone. And over the millennia, it's become very uh, eroded. And But you have remaining these beautiful pointed hills, uh, gorgeous landscape. It's on the Li River and uh, very beautiful there. Uh, Guilin is just a special place. If you go to China, you really should go here. Um, uh, you can rent boats if you want and go out onto the river. I enjoy this shot. Uh, this was a, a class out on a day trip, a field trip with their teacher in her ethnic garb. Uh, lots of little uh, streams and rivers floating or, or, um, around, designed around the city. And uh, again, very peaceful, very serene here, quiet and uh, lovely place to visit. There's an island there called the Kissing Island, and uh, it's, this ends up being a resort city for a lot of young people that have uh, been married that come here on their honeymoon. This fellow fishing on the river. Lots of rental bikes around. If you don't want to drive a car, you can rent a bike, and uh, these happen to be electric bikes, so you can get around at a speedy clip. China makes a lot of wine. It's become very popular there, and uh, I thought, since we're in the Napa Valley, we should be aware of that too. But literally hundreds of wineries uh, in across China. And one of the stores we dropped into had quite a good selection of Chinese wines. We had the opportunity one day to visit a, a tea research institute. And uh, it was really an interesting uh, uh, time spent. Uh, they breed and raise and try to improve on tea plants and then spread that information around to the various companies in China that. Uh, make tea. This is our motley crew on the right there. Drying the tea. We also were um, uh, introduced to a, a Chinese tea ceremony. We kind of think of Japanese tea ceremony, but Chinese have been doing this just as long. And uh, it was full of uh, delicacy, beauty, and nuance. This is the backyard of the Institute. Pretty place, again, calm and serene. But we're going to go to those mountains in the background. Up this tram up to the top, you uh, have beautiful views up there. This is very typical of the mountain uh, landscape around the city of Guilin. I want to show you this. We were out searching for food once again, and uh, this is a hot pot restaurant. And uh, so I'm going to, this is a video, so I'm going to play this for you. You'll see this. So your food comes by in the bowl, you pick out what you want, put it into the hot pot, like the fellow on the left, cook it and eat to your pleasure. Kind of fun, nice idea. And some very beautiful pagodas on Lake Fear um, in, uh, off of downtown uh, Guilin. Uh, Lake Fear is F-I-R, not fearsome. These are the um, reed flute caves uh, outside of Guilin. Uh, again, there's a, in that kind of karst landscape I was describing, there's a lot of erosion. So you have sinkholes, you have caverns, and a uh, very beautiful place to visit. We also ran into this guy. I bought a painting from him. He is, uh, he was, we were told he was one of three people left that still do hand painting. And he uses his fingernails, his thumbs, his, you know, his forefinger, his palms, and he pushes the paint around and makes absolutely beautiful things. If you look at that painting in the back behind him, that's, that's one of his. Quite beautiful. So we got on a boat and headed down to another city. Uh, this is a Lee River cruise. And we'll be going to the uh, town of uh, Yangshuo. Again, that pretty architecture or uh, our landscape that you see so much uh, in the Guilin area. If you can't afford a big boat like the one on the left, you can rent a smaller boat and uh, get there just a little more slowly. One of the things I found interesting was th this gesturing that goes on. Uh, these uh, ladies were having uh, their pictures taken and uh, men as well. They would have their pictures taken uh, gesturing as if I present you with the landscape. And uh, I thought that was kind of fun. So I decided to you know, when in Guilin, do the same. A little diversion here, Mao. Mao is everywhere. <laughs> and uh, he's on license plates. He's on the money. 
He's on revolutionary posters. He's on teacups. Uh, very common for uh, countries, particularly communist countries. Uh, you know, if you're in Cuba, it's Che and uh, Fidel, uh, Ho Chi Minh and uh, Vietnam and so on. Of course, we put our presidents on our money too. So, uh, Young Sh uh, Sho is um, a really interesting place. It's a small town. It's only about 300,000 uh, people. And again, it's kind of a preferred resort place for uh, Chinese to visit. And uh, very pretty town, very pretty city. Uh, again, very calm there. And uh, also a lot of ethnic groups here. So you see a lot of different kinds of food, and products, and uh, ethnic dress. You also find, as you do throughout China, Starbucks, KFC, McDonald's. This town also had beer halls, uh, hot dog vendors, and um, pizza places. So uh, they're very uh, multinational. We bought a backpack from this guy. You've got to check out his uh, little stool he's sitting on and uh, tiny, and it's also broken. These uh, also, everybody's always on a uh, cell phone, pretty much like here, as are these guys in the uh, lower right here. Here's a spice shop again. They're cooking up, um, I'm not sure what this is, but it's probably one of the uh, chili flavored uh, condiment. Uh, motor scooters are probably the predominant form of transportation uh, in China. Uh, they're affordable. And uh, this one, I love this pattern of the uh, raindrops on this uh, umbrella to protect the rider. Um, if you own a car, don't park it beneath a tree. <laughs> uh, the birds are vicious there. Uh, interesting thing, though, a little note, side note about um, motor scooters. Uh, in the last few years, they've been almost completely converted over to electric. Uh, by 2025, China says no more gas cars in China, uh, particularly in urban areas. Uh, they plan on having everybody driving electric by 2025. All the motor scooters are electric. Uh, I never saw a gas-operated one in any of the major cities that we were going, uh, we were in. And uh, you have to be very careful if you're a pedestrian there because they're very quiet. You don't hear them coming little street pizza here. Here's another spice shop on the right. This is a little bit of a video I want to show you. Just they, again, an ethnic group pushing their product, but, uh, and you'll see the two there pounding the, uh, the chilies. <laughs> I thought you'd like that. <laughs> anyway, getting into their work and, uh, and then how much better to do it with music, right? Chengdu uh, is a big city. Uh, Chengdu is about, uh, I believe it's about uh, 10, 9, 10 million people, very large. It's also known best as the Panda City, and you'll see that in a moment. But a lot of building there, again, these are these large, large uh, residential uh, structures. Lots of pandas. Uh, I like this picture of this guy. He was just relaxing, enjoying the day, uh, you know, communicating with people on his cell phone, and there's his kitty, kitty with him uh, on his scooter. The, uh, there's a research base there that, where they breed the giant pandas, and uh, I'll take you through a little bit of that. Uh, you might even see some uh, kung fu pandas here, like on the lower right, but actually not. Pandas are kind of lazy. They, uh, As our guide said, they... Uh, they eat bamboo shoots, they sleep, and they crap. And I think she was kind of tired of pandas after all the uh, tours she's guided. Um, here's one sleeping. <laughs> and, uh, but they love their pandas, and, uh, and as they should. Uh, it's their special national animal. And uh, you see young girls wearing these uh, little uh, hair ornaments all the time around the city of Chengdu. Something a lot of people don't realize is there's also a red panda. Uh, it looks more like a big raccoon and they're very hyperactive. They really are just all over the place, but a uh, very interesting animal, very pretty. There's some ladies uh, in the, uh, back in the urban city area. Uh, they're making polish, they polish up and clean up these nuts and uh, form them into bracelets and uh, long strings that can be used for uh, necklaces. Fish on a stick fresh fruit. Another thing you find in China uh, traveling around is 
people uh, like to have their ears cleaned. <laughs> and uh, they very often do it out when the weather's good out in public. And that's good advertising. And uh, when they're all done doing the cleaning, uh, they pull out a um, tuning fork and bang it and let you hear it. It's kind of proof positive that it was a good job. We also had the opportunity while we were there to visit a absolutely wonderful, uh, beautiful Buddhist monastery uh, in the city of uh, Chengdu. Very pretty, very, cal very calm there, very serene, uh, as probably a Buddhist monastery should be. Back to the train station. The, the, by the way, uh, airports and train stations are absolutely enormous. Uh, they're huge. Uh, they have so many rails, heads coming in. Um, this was our car. Uh, again, you can see very clean, very comfortable. And on to Chongqing. Chongqing is on the uh, Yangtze River. We had a chance. That we, I wish we'd had more time to spend in uh, Chongqing, but we, we didn't. Uh, but we did have a chance to kind of go downtown and hang out. This was probably the most crowded area we ran into, but it's also, you have to remember, a tourist area for Chinese. It was so packed in here. When you jump into the crowd, it would just kind of carry you along like a, a flowing lava <laughs> down the street. When you'd had enough, you'd step out into a doorway or into a restaurant and uh, kind of try to get some fresh air. Uh, I think this guy in the lower right says it best. Lots of stalls, again, lots of interesting product and food. Now this is interesting, the guys on the left are uh, selling baked chickens. This is your Chinese KFC. Uh, they pack the chicken in clay, they put it in an oven, they bake it. You go pick up a hot clay uh, chicken, take it home, break up the clay, and you've got a nice cooked uh, chicken ready to go. And apparently they're very juicy and nice. They retain a lot of the moisture that way in flavor. And this lady's selling just about everything on a stick, I think. I love this shot. It, it just, to me, uh, kind of uh, visages of, uh, of ancient China, this fellow. Uh, he was an accountant and a calligrapher. Uh, another little uh, bronze statue. And you notice again how polished it is because people walking by and uh, touching it for good luck. We finally got out of the craziness of the mass of people surging through the street there and uh, decided to take some side alleys and just kind of walk around and see what life is like behind these business residences. And uh, again, very beautiful little quiet courtyards. There's a, uh, this is called the Great Hall of the People. Uh, it's uh, kind of one of the, the cultural center, political center for um, the city. and. Uh, it, it's a huge building. It has capacity of 4,000 people. Also, uh, here is the museum for the Three Gorges Dam. You still see a lot of this, which is kind of nice in a way. Uh, people that are uh, kind of working the low end part of the market and uh, m you know, moving their uh, fruit around and uh, things for sale. It's kind of neat to see. Something else that you'll also see in China, which is a lot of fun, is social dancing. Well, dancing of all kinds, but a lot of times you'll be out at night walking around. And by the way, China is very safe to go out and travel around uh, either by yourself or with friends. Uh, we never had any trouble. And uh, it's, again, people are very nice there. Um, but social dancing. And at night you'll be walking around and you'll hear some music and you come around a corner and there in a plaza in front of a bank are all of these people out there practicing their dancing. It's a big tradition there. They also have a lot of contests, national contests, and people are really uh, geared up for it. They love it. So we got on the ship uh, to head down the uh, Yangtze and uh, uh, to the Three Gorges Dam and uh, Yichang. Uh, river really flows hard here. There's a confluence of this river and another river. And uh, boy, uh, it, it water's really moving here. So everything's pretty well anchored in. It's an interesting ride. Oh, this lady on the left. Boy, talk about carrying a load. Look at that. Would not want to arm wrestle with her. Uh, anyway, the um, we left at night. Beautiful city at night, well lit up and uh, very proud of their city. The Yangtze is a huge river. There's two river systems in China, in the north, the Yellow River, and in the south, the Yangtze, or in the middle, actually, uh, is the Yangtze River. And uh, it's big, really big. 
and uh, lots of ships. It's like the Mississippi in that regard. Lots of ship traffic up and down. Lots of interesting architecture. Uh, we we're told that the wealthy like to build their homes along it. Uh, this is a beautiful home up here, but uh, this shot on the right also shows you the rise and fall of the river. Here it is at a pretty low point, uh, and it's about 75 feet up to the top here uh, where the uh, things start growing again. And each year the river fluctuates tremendously. Again, lots of interesting landscape to see. Little sunset on the, on the uh, cruise. You end up at the Three Gorges Dam, the largest dam in the world. It's a, a power generator for China uh, and it uh, provides tremendous amount of, I, I forget how many megawatts of power, uh, but it's just a tremendous output of power here. Uh, I grabbed a couple photos off the internet. I hope you don't mind. These are not mine, but uh, here's an aerial view of the Three Gorges Dam you can see here in the, on the left and it blocks and holds up a lot of water. This year, they had tremendous flooding in uh, China. Uh, there were torrential rains throughout much of China and uh, the pressure built up so badly behind the dam, they had to release a lot of it and ended up flooding two uh, provinces downstream. This is the city where we were just uh, at Chongqing and it flooded as well. Back on a train, heading to a, a national park of uh, Zhang Zhaji. Um, anyway, the thing I like about traveling by train, so many wonderful uh, views of people and their homes and suburbs and agricultural fields. And of course, those chance encounters again, this little guy was going back and forth looking into our sleeper car. Uh, we kept the door open and pretty soon he came back with his father and we had a nice chat with him. His brother uh, taught at the uh, Virginia Tech University. Small world. Zhang Zhaji is a beautiful place. Uh, if you ever saw the movie Avatar that James Cameron made, um, this was uh, many of the scenes in that were based on uh, this area. Uh, he sent his film crews here to get uh, uh, footage so that they could use it in the movie. And it's a stunning, stunning place. And go down into the ravines and I think we took about a nine mile hike uh, through the ravines down below and following the river through. Lots of wild monkeys there and they're very adept at stealing uh, any food you may have in your pockets or your backpacks. Lots of flora and fauna, very pretty. And of course kids, uh, they're there with their parents and uh, walking around and, uh, and when they find out you're from America, they want to show you how they can count to 10 and uh, name all sorts of things. I like the shot of these workers taking a little break and playing a game. And street sweepers. Um, again, wonderful, beautiful, clean streets. And notice the mountains in the background here. That's where we were just from. And another brand new high rise uh, residential apartments in uh, or homes in uh, Zhang Zhezhi. We ended up in Shanghai. It was raining the, the first day we were there, uh, so we didn't get, uh, didn't get a chance to go out too much. What we did, we went out to the Bund. The Bund is a course, uh, causeway or courseway that uh, follows the river and through the middle of town, through or the edge of town on the river. And uh, all, everybody's important is kind of on the Bund. <laughs> anyway, it's a beautiful city, beautiful skyline, particularly at night. And it's a newer city uh, as far as China goes, much newer city in that uh, it's uh, home. It was home to many colonial groups of uh, French, British, Dutch, Portuguese. And uh, this is uh, an area in the French Quarter, which has now become kind of uh, the Rodeo Drive of the, uh, of the city. Uh, Shanghai, by the way, is the biggest city in, uh, in China, about 28 million people. Remember that all of California has about 38 million people. Um, these lovely old alleyways and uh, between these uh, colonial buildings. Very pretty there. There's also a museum there uh, celebrating uh, Mao Zedong starting the uh, Chinese party. And uh, lots of history there. This was back in, uh, I think, 1919 that it was started. Uh, young people that are party members like to stand in front of the flag and flex their muscles. 
but I like this old guy out on the street. A uh, quick interesting thing here, uh, these are homes that are probably scheduled by the government to be knocked down so they can build larger residential apartments like those on the upper left. Uh, the people boarded up the windows because if the government can't see if there's movement inside, they can't, uh, they can't really knock them down. It's, it's a kind of a way of keeping the government out of their business and a stalling tactic to try to keep their property as long as they can. But the inevitable is on the horizon. Uh, one last thing here, we managed to go to the uh, Yu Gardens, uh, a must-see place if you're in Shanghai, and uh, very beautiful architecture, old style, again, very calm and quiet place to visit. And a little bit, I'll let you read this, but a little bit about the significance of the Chinese dragon. This is kind of a, the dragon is representative, it's a unity symbol, and it's representative of all of these various uh, totems belonging to different tribes, but as they began to unite, it became kind of their e pluribus unum, so to speak. So it's a very symbolic and important uh, figure in Chinese culture. Our last night in the city. And then this, the maglev, magnetically suspended uh, train. This is the fastest train right now in the world. Well, not the fastest, but it's the only maglev train, let's put it that way, in the world. And it'll take you from downtown Shanghai out to the international airport. Normally that's an hour, hour and a half because of traffic and by car. You'll be there in seven to eight minutes. It, uh, its normal speed is about 186 miles per hour. It can go as high as 270. Um, and I have a I'll give you a ride here. This is not the entire ride, but a portion of it. Just, uh, I hope this will run smoothly for you. You'll see this, but uh, the train is, it, it, it uh, was not going the full 186 the day we rode. It was about 130 to 150 miles per hour. But these cars are uh, traveling at around 60 to 70 miles per hour. So it gives you an idea of how quickly this thing is moving. And that's it. And uh, so this is uh, Ron Rogers, and I approve this document. All right. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, let's see. We have some questions, and I'll start reading those out so you can answer them. Sure. Um, our first question is Did you have guide or guides on your travels? And if yes. so, were they arranged for you or, a, or were you able to choose them? Well, you can do either, but uh, in our case, we uh, uh, let the company that we went with, which was a company called uh, TCT, which is uh, Travel China Tibet. Um, and we uh, uh, let them choose the guides. Uh, some were good, some were okay. <laughs> and um, uh, yeah, so it, it uh, we kind of just went with the flow. They would greet you at the airport with a sign holding your name, and you'd jump in the car and off you'd go. And um, yeah, it, 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 it worked very smoothly. Uh, but you could probably, if you wanted to arrange your own guide, you could probably do that. But we had a separate guide for each city. I'm going to move aside here so my wife can get in here and talk to. Okay, um, okay so and how do you rate the Chinese wines? Did you... I'm sorry, I said this is Pam. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. How do you rate the how do you rate the Chinese wines? You know, I don't know that we had any while we were there, yeah. but uh, I uh, so uh, Chinese what? wines. Oh. So uh, I'm I I think we probably had a bottle somewhere or not, but I mean, it was, I, I would imagine it was probably pretty comparable. But uh, mm -hmm. I'm not, actually I'm not a huge wine drinker, so I'm probably not the person to comment on that. <laughs> Um, another question asks is, were there any health concerns eating the street food? Yeah, um, so I didn't. <laughs> uh, yeah, we were talking earlier uh, before we started this program about in, um, you know, vaccinations and that sort of thing. Uh, generally, uh, you can travel in China without having any vaccinations. I mean, as long as your vaccinations are up to uh, snuff, you're probably fine. Uh, we did, uh, we're with Kaiser uh, and they were, wanted us to have a typhoid shot. If you get out into the rural areas, there's a uh, more of a chance of that. And also in some of the food. Uh, and if you're an adventurous foodie, um, they probably recommend that you have like a typhoid shot, but uh, I didn't uh, for the most part. Uh, I, we we yeah. ate mostly in restaurants. Yeah. And... So I, 
but uh, I, I, I encourage anybody to enjoy. <laughs> Okay, and that's all the questions I have so far. Any other questions out there? Feel free to type them in. Yeah, it was actually, that was very tempting. I mean, to look at the food in the, so many of the stalls and the uh, market areas, uh, you're just going, oh, that looks so good. I'd love to try that. But uh, uh, we usually had full meals coming up, and uh, we kind of didn't want to spoil our meals. But uh, yeah. Definitely didn't try the durian. <laughs> It um, it made me weak in the knees when we walked by the durian booth. <laughs> um, says uh, my acupuncturist, Dr. Ho Lam Sang, went to his hometown, turned around, and left because it was so filthy dirty. Did you see any of this? You know, we were mostly in major areas, major urban areas. And uh, so we didn't. Uh, it, it's possible that maybe out in the rural areas, they just maybe don't have uh, the money, the manpower to try to keep things as clean as they do in the urban areas. Uh, or but, maybe we didn't see some of the areas. Yeah. That... And, and we weren't hitting the outer areas of the cities. You only have so many days in each uh, location. So, um, I mean, I love to get on the ground and just walk and go explore. But uh, um, most of what we saw was very clean, uh, very much like Japan. And what was the, your favorite meal you had on your trip? <laughs> oh, gosh. I had a couple of that. What was your a couple of favorite meals? We had meals. a lot of meals. Um, <laughs> okay, so let me uh, kind of, I'm going to kind of. Uh, don't, don't go there. No, no. I'm not, <laughs> I will. Uh, I, I, I have to confess, uh, more than once we did uh, hit McDonald's. Because <laughs> 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 there's a point where uh, you finally say, I love this food, but I need some Americano. <laughs> And there are lots of McDonald's restaurants around. The dumplings are delicious. Yeah, dumplings are great. Uh, we had, I, I have so many thousands of photos here that I wish I could share with you. Uh, much of it of food, by the way, and many of the meals that we had. And uh, if I were to show you some of those, I think you'd go, oh my gosh. Yeah, so yeah, the food is wonderful there. Um, were the high rises ever tested in a real earthquake? Oh yeah, yeah. They have earthquakes all the time there. Mm -hmm. uh, in the one that happened in 2008, uh, there were none, none of the high-rise buildings that collapsed. Um, they, uh, it was mostly older architecture and uh, brick and mortar kinds of building that collapsed. So I, 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 I take them at the word for that. Okay, how, may, how did the locals regard you as Americans and as Caucasians? Well, you know, and we didn't see a lot of us there. Uh, you know, <laughs> it was, uh, we, we mostly just saw Chinese people and, you know, they, they would look at us, they would see that we were different. But, you know, in one, one sense, we were also traveling in areas that are probably fairly, well, many of them were heavily traveled by uh, and touristed by Chinese. So they're probably used to seeing people uh, that look different. And uh, so, but no, we were always treated well. We didn't have any problems. We, we chose not to get involved in politics or talk any of that. Um, I, I kind of feel like we were rock stars at time, mm -hmm. at times because people would walk by us and then you'd hear them either giggling or something and you'd turn <laughs> around and they were walking, you know, looking back at us and um, but they like to engage they wanted you to too. Get, they wanted to have their picture taken with us. Yeah, and, yeah. Well, yeah. especially the young kids. Uh, the well, the young kids and you know, up through their twenties, they liked uh, having their pictures taken with Americans. So that was kind of fun. Okay, and is English spoken much anywhere? A lot, uh, but um, you know, it's it's so interesting uh, today. If you if there's an internet available, <laughs> uh, you know, translation is so easy. And uh, when you approach somebody and you didn't know what, uh, we, we bought a, uh, uh, a bracelet for our goddaughter and I had it made in a uh, jewelry place and they didn't speak any English, but we would ask a question to the uh, smartphone and uh, hit translate and they'd go, ah, yes, yes. And then they would respond. And so it was actually very easy. Technology has made it very easy to communicate that way. Took a lot of pressure off of us. By the way, one thing I might mention about uh, uh, the internet in Japan uh, in uh, China is uh, they call it the great cyber wall. <laughs> they uh, pretty much keep the rest of the world out. They have their own internet system and uh, you're pretty much blocked from anything here in the United States. So you can't get Google, you can't get Facebook, Twitter's not going to work, your news channels won't work. Uh, the only way you can do that is if you uh, 
uh, install on your smartphone before you go to China uh, a VPN, which is a virtual private network. And uh, there are lots of providers around surrounding the country of China. And it allows you to sneak in your uh, normal internet sources uh, and, uh, and not be tracked. So uh, VPN is the way to go if you're going to go to China. That's good to know. Um, did you attend any traditional water dance performances? I don't think we did. Um, we kind of, uh, we did go to some interesting uh, performances by groups. Uh, you've probably seen on television advertised uh, Chinese acrobatic groups and whatnot. And we did uh, attend a couple shows that way. And uh, uh, I mean, it was always exciting and just tremendous, tremendous uh, performances that they put on. They, they have a real sense of showmanship and uh, uh, very enjoyable. But no, the water dances uh, performances I didn't see. Okay, and someone wants to know what is the what was the air quality like? That's interesting because we took a lot of masks along. Uh, we were prepared, never used them. Well, not um, never, but well, rarely. one one day maybe we did. But uh, by and large, um, it was uh, it was smoggy uh, in most of the major cities simply because of the number of people there. But uh, uh, it was not as it wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. Uh, in fact, uh, and of course, you get out into some areas and you have blue, wonderful blue sky. So uh, uh, cities are always a problem. Um, I think in a lot of ways, though, China is probably going to solve their pollution problem faster than we are, you know, especially with the move toward electric vehicles. Uh, they're aware, they're very aware of the, the problems and the health risks associated with air pollution. And I think they're working very rapidly to uh, try to mitigate that as best they can. Between the heat and the air pollution, it was hard to tell what was affecting us more. But um, yeah, it didn't seem bad when you were out and about. I mean, I've, I've seen pictures uh, where, uh, you know, it's, it, you, you, you just can't see, but I also grew up in LA, so I understand those days too, <laughs> so. What time, what time of year did you go? This was in June. Um, since uh, we're all teachers, well, we, um, I'm retired now and my wife is retired, but uh, 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 the other uh, two in our group, they, uh, they're still teaching. And so we had to wait till June. Uh, I've been asked many times, uh, were you anywhere near Wuhan? Well, Wuhan is on the Yangtze River, but uh, we didn't really go there. And it was about, uh, you know, they didn't have the outbreak in 2000, uh, 2019 of the uh, coronavirus until October, middle October, early November. So we were not there during that. But it was hot. It was hot. Yeah, summers are hot. Um, any sense of how rural people felt about being forced to move to urban high-rise apartments? Yeah, there's a lot of resistance, uh, and and they don't give them. It's the, eight o'clock. They don't give the uh, um, apartments away for free. Uh, they end up. Um, they, they, the people have to pay for them, but the the government does compensate them for their land and the uh, the places that they lived in before. But uh, yeah, there is a lot of resistance to it, I think. Uh, not everybody wants to do that. Uh, but a lot of the younger people want that shift. They want that change. And uh, so I think as the population gets older, there's going to be uh, just by attrition, less uh, resistance to it. Okay, I'm gonna skim through. Some of these are repeat questions, so I'm gonna skim down. Was there an extra sense of security crossing when first entering the country? Um, well, I'm not sure what you mean by security, but uh, it, it, it was no more difficult than traveling into uh, any other city that I've traveled in the world. And let's see, the air quality, we covered the air quality and uh, internet use. You talked about the internet, uh, the Chinese exclusive, so yeah. Um, so I think that's all of our questions. Well, thank you. Uh, this has been fun. I hope you uh, all enjoyed the, uh, the photos and uh, uh, hope to see you again in the future. Yeah. Thank you. And again, thank you to Constance and uh, Stephanie. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ron. That was just a, a thoroughly enjoyable and delightful presentation. Um, I learned a lot and uh, it was it was very exciting. You added a, a whole bunch of new photos from uh, <laughs> our, our presentation, our little practice session the other day, and they were delightful.
Um, I you. want to remind everybody that uh, we are going to, we, we will meet again next month on Thursday, November 19th from 7 to 8. And Flo Schilling, she's a longtime local travel agent, and she's going to share a tour that she took with a group of people to Bulgaria and Romania. So I hope you join us on Thursday, November 19th from 7 to 8. Thank you again for being here this evening. Thank, Thank you. you, Ron. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.